Did you know that meditating on God's word is the way it becomes spiritual food to us? In other words, meditating, not reading, meditating is how we swallow this spiritual food. Um, just as in, with physical food, it can be on our plate, it can, it can, we can even put it in our mouth. But until I swallow it, I receive it, it cannot bring me growth, nutrition, energy. No. And the word of God, though it is living and it is powerful, it must be received into my heart in order to give me spiritual strength, spiritual energy, spiritual growth, nutrition. And meditation is the method of, of swallowing the word of God. Jesus, remember how he said, if my word abides in you, abides in you, this thing of that I have received it, and now it is a part of me. Here's a very interesting and powerful thought. In John 5, 38, Jesus said to the Pharisees, who knew the scriptures backwards and forwards. They wore scripture verses on their clothing. And yet Jesus said this to them, you do not have the word of God abiding in you. <laughs> and yet they had it in their head. But he said, no, you've never swallowed it. You haven't received it in your heart. And so um, meditating is, is a powerful and import, imperative thing that we as, as Christians do. And we say, what does that look like? What, is that, what does meditating look like? Well, I thought let's, let's take for a moment a, a verse to which most of us are, are rather familiar. Let's say Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. And, and we say, oh, do I know that? Oh, yes. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. Yeah, I know that scripture. But how do I meditate on that? So that it becomes life. So that I assimilate spiritual food so it can turn into spiritual energy and supernatural life. I stop and I say, Trust in the Lord. And as you and I meditate, what we're doing, we're doing it in the presence of the Holy Spirit, who God said would guide us into all truth, who would reveal the things of God to us. Oh, it's a wondrous thing. It's a wondrous thing when you and I acknowledge the presence of the Holy Spirit as we meditate on God's word. And um, it, But we say, trust in the Lord. Trust. Wow, I'm not even, I knew that verse for 20 years. But I'm not, like, just how do you trust in the Lord? Tr I, I don't even know if I know how to trust. Trust in the Lord with all my heart? Have I seriously said, you know what, Lord, I'm not looking anywhere else. My loyalties as far as, as placing the full weight of my life, they are not anywhere else. I trust you, Lord with all of my heart trust in the lord that meditating allows me to swallow it though i may have had it in my head for years and then he says don't lean on your own understanding it doesn't matter how everyone else is doing it it doesn't matter how i've done it all my life God says, no, don't go back to that. Don't put God in the small box of your understanding. Don't do it. And as we meditate, how God's Holy Spirit will say, You're, 
Are you walking all your Christian life by your own understanding? And then he says, in, in all your ways, acknowledge him. Ask him about everything. Is this all right, Lord? I, I was planning to do this, Lord. I was going to make, Lord, is, are you in this decision? Oh, we say, when we meditate, we say, oh, I can't believe how many things in my life are outside the lordship of Jesus. I just... They're my own decisions. I say, God, I'm doing this and I'm doing that. I made this plan and I made that. And uh, I hope you come along, Lord. Oh, but as I meditate in all that inclusive word, your ways acknowledge, is this all right, Father? And God says if we do those three things, the God of the universe will direct my personal steps. Can you imagine that? The God of the universe will direct my path. But you and I understand that meditation is how we take what we may have learned in our head. It comes into our heart and by that, by receiving it, by swallowing it, it can become spiritual strength, spiritual nutrition, growth and and energy. So here I ask you very quickly, what disciplines have you and I put in our lives so that we consistently meditate on his word? I'd like to ask you that personal question. Again, forgive me for repeating myself, but unless we do this thing, we will read our Bible in the morning and we will even acknowledge that it was wonderful at the moment. But without meditation, it entered my head and I said that was very good. But by noon, if someone asks you, what did you read today? You will not have a clue. And if you and I don't have a clue, that means it is not giving me spiritual energy, nutrition, or, or growth. If I can't tell by noon what I read that day, what God had me take hold of, what I'm chewing on in order to be able to, to, to swallow that and, and process that. The living, powerful word of God. So what disciplines do you and I have in our life to make time or provision to meditate on the word of God? We say disciplines. Now, are we getting into legalism or whatever foolish thing we come up with? Well, do you and I put disciplines in our lives to eat physical food? Or do we say, oh, you know, no, no, no. If it happens, it happens. And if it doesn't, it doesn't. <laughs> no, we don't. We don't say, you know, this is a busy time of year with all you kids in involved in sports, we just won't be eating this month. I just don't think there'll be time for it. We say, there is time for it. In fact, if we're going to do it properly, we will have specific times. We will plan it. We will prepare for it. And we will sit down and partake because without it, our lives are at risk. And if you and I don't have the spiritual disciplines in place of meditating, feeding on the word of God, then we will become spiritually malnutritioned. Our growth will be very small. And we will probably be bereft of, of, of spiritual energy. We will, we will probably be very weak spiritually most of the time. So um, we get it, don't we? We understand. Meditating is so effective and so powerful that here in Psalm chapter 1, which again, I'm sure you know, but it is powerful that God would speak this so clearly. He begins in verse 1, he says, blessed, blessed. And I'll tell you, when you and I have the blessing of God, nothing can match it. Very quickly, the blessing of God is when God takes a little boy's lunch, Jesus does, and the Bible says he blessed it. And then he fed 5,000 women plus women and children. That's the blessing of God. You and I cannot 
be without the blessing of God, right? It says, blessed is the man who doesn't walk in the counsel of ungodly people. He doesn't stand where sinners stand. He's not, that's not his lifestyle. He doesn't sit with mockers. Oh, yeah, God does this or something. No, no, no. But... His delight is in the law of the Lord. We say, Lord, I love this. I don't choke this down. You and I didn't choke down dinner tonight. We relished it. We, we don't choke. Oh, 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 where's the shortest psalm? No, no, we say, oh, my delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates. Day and night. Did you know you can meditate on God's word in the nighttime? It's a powerful time to meditate. Next time you wake up, just begin to meditate on the word of God. You say, oh, but I don't know if I know. You know what? You know the Lord is my shepherd. Say, start meditating on that. You know that one phrase? That's enough. And the Holy Spirit will come and minister supernatural life to you because you've, you're swallowing the living, powerful word of God. But this is what he says. If we meditate on his word day and night, we made provision for that. Look what he says. He will be like a tree planted by rivers of water. And these three things God says will happen if I make provision to meditate on his word. This tree will, will bring forth its fruit in its season. Is that a big deal? Well, in John 15, Jesus said, this is how God is glorified in my life, that I bear much fruit. We see then even bearing fruit correlates with meditating, swallowing, receiving the word of God, meditating on it. I will bring forth fruit. That is, the, that is a result of receiving spiritual food by meditation. Secondly, my leaf will not wither. We see a tree whose leaf is withering. It means it, it, the heat has gotten to it. It, it, it's, it may even be on its way to death. But God says, when you meditate on the word of God, you will always have the restoring, the, the freshness of God's life. Despite the heat, despite this, despite the drought, because you see, you're, you're planted by a, you have a secret river that you're drawing from every day right your leaf will not wither. you will not be always at the end of yourself well maybe ourselves but at the beginning of him which is a river of life and thirdly oh my look at that <laughs> he says aren't you glad god doesn't lie yeah he says and whatever he does will prosper by meditation, because meditation causes the word of God to enter me and bring life to me and change me and show me and teach me. So may you and I, this week, begin to put disciplines in place. Buy yourself a pack of index cards. That morning, every morning, say, I don't leave my time with God until I have written a verse or three or four or five down on this card. And that goes with me. And I don't lose those. I go back and, and chew on those again. And even before I go to sleep at night, I will spend a whole two minutes. Wow. But receiving those again, allowing God to, to teach me through those. It is whatever it is, but begin to put disciplines in place to receive God's word. Amen. 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 The word of God. Thank God. It's his word. Powerful. Powerful. But tonight we're going to look at the subject called words, the game changer and a key to consecration. And so let's pray together. Oh, Father, once again, we stand in awe of you. Everything you do, everything you say, Father, all that you are is so wondrous to us, oh God. And we thank you that you're our God and you reveal yourself to us. And you let us have you. Oh, Father, thank you. We pray once again tonight that you would teach us. You said your spirit, 
Though they are hidden from our natural eyes, our natural heart, and our natural ears, you said your Holy Spirit would reveal even the deep things of God to us. And Father, for this, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. When God created man in his own image, as Genesis 1.27 tells us, one of the ways he made us like him is our ability to speak words. Though the rest of creation was created by God, yes, only mankind was created in God's image. And of course, we were created for God's glory. Now, I just want to take a side thought here. It doesn't exactly go with what we're talking about. But remember, you and I can live for God's glory or we can live for our own glory. But then we will have wasted our lives because we have invested in the world, either its fame or its possessions or its pleasures. That's how we lived our days. Those were what we lived them for. That's the world. And 1 John 2 says, and the world's passing away and all of it. But whoever does the will of God ooh, abides forever. Yes. And, but this world is going to pass away, as we just said. Um, and Jesus spoke and warned us about that. Give us wisdom in Matthew 16, 26. He says, what is a man profited? Not God profited. No, 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 no. What is a man profit? Me. If I gain the whole world and lose my own soul, and what will I give in exchange for it? But then he explained that. In the next verse, he said, for the Son of Man will come, and then he will reward every man according to his works where I invested my life, either in God's will for me, which is then it goes with me, or I lived for this world. So we can live either for God's glory or for the glory of this world. But as you and I consecrate ourselves to the Lord, first our spirit, all that has to do with my spirit and my relationship with my Heavenly Father, because you, that's how we have a relationship with God, by our spirits. And as we do that, then through that part of our life, God is glorified. Our souls, right? All that has to do with my soul, my need for security, my need for peace, my need for love, my need for purpose, on and on and on. In all those things, I consecrate myself to the Lord. Then he is glorified through that. And then we have a body. Everything that has to do with our bodies. Romans 12, 1 says, present your body as a living sacrifice to God. He says, your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Right? And so as we, everything that has to do with our bodies, we consecrate to the Lord. Then he will be glorified in those areas of our life. But tonight, we want to look at one area of specific consecration to the Lord and how God's word teaches it, that it teaches us that it powerfully affects many, many things. And that is in the area of our words consecrating every word to the Lord. We're going to look at four things that God says about that. But first of all, before we look at those four things, I mean, should I? Should I consecrate every word to the Lord? Well, Colossians 3.17 says, whatever you do, that's pretty inclusive, in word or deed, do all. There's another inclusive word. <laughs> if it would have said do most, then we would have a little, little bit. Do some. No, it says whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. 
That means he has to sign his name to every word I speak. Matthew 12, verses 36 and 37, Jesus spoke about words. He said, I say to you, every idle word men speak. Every? Yes. They will give account of in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified. By your words you will be condemned. In 1 Timothy 4.12, God addresses our words. He says, let no one despise your youth. Don't say, oh, they're so young, they can't live for God. No, no. He says, don't do it. But be an example to the believers in word. The first one he put there. In 1 Peter 4.11, he says, if anyone speaks. Now, what I did is I went back to the Greek to see if this sort of meant like really preaching or teaching or no, no, no. As you went back in all the places it was used in scripture, it was just, and Jesus said to them, or Peter said to him, it, it's only just our speech. It says, if anyone speaks, let it be as one who speaks God's words. Every word we are to consecrate to the Lord. And tonight, I want us to look at promises, wonderful promises, powerful promises for those who will be consecrated to the Lord in all of their words. But before we do that, we must be reminded of what James 3, 8 tells us. Here, God declares a fact. He says, no man, there's God's absolutes again. He didn't say some people. He said, no one can tame the tongue. Now, you and I know that when an animal is tamed, then it's trusted. You can let it roam. It's, it's fine. They're fine. They're tame. They won't hurt you. The word of God says, nobody can tame the tongue. You don't let it off the leash. It's not trustworthy. It'll bite somebody. It'll destroy somebody. He says, nobody can. It is unruly evil, full of deadly poison. And so the tongue must be kept on the leash under the control of the Holy Spirit at all times. The consecration of my tongue means that I am fully yielded to God's Holy Spirit. Jesus is my Lord. The head and the body, the reality of that oneness. So my words are the real evidence of my oneness with Jesus or my lack of it. A very powerful thing, right? So what are these promises, these mighty promises attached to my words being consecrated to the Lord? Here's the first one. For this one, I hope you'll be a patient student of the word of God. Sometimes if it doesn't come in one sentence, right, we're done listening. But I need you to follow this through because it's a powerful and a wonderful promise. In Isaiah 58, God says here, if you turn your foot away from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day. Now, let me ask you, now in the New Testament, is the seventh day of the week, that was the Sabbath, is the seventh day of the week, which was called the Sabbath, the only day that is holy to us now? And Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday aren't holy, or Thursday, or Friday. No, not anymore. Now that you and I are one with Jesus, he is the head and we are the body. Every day is a holy day. Every single one. We are to walk in one with the God of God, the holy God of Israel. And that's why in Colossians 2.16, it says, don't let anyone judge you in food or drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbath. And these were all very critical physical observances of the Old Testament. 
But he explains in verse 17. These are a shadow. When you have the shadow of something, it, it's the outline, but it's not the real thing. We have a shadow of your hand. That, oh, we say, oh, that's what a hand looks. But this thing, man, it can do everything, right? He says, those Old Testament observe the Sabbaths, the new moons, they were a shadow of the real thing. The Sabbath was God's beautiful provision for their bodily rest. Otherwise, they would have worked themselves seven days a week, right? We're so foolish. So God said, no, I don't want, I, I want them to have physical rest. But Jesus in the New Testament, in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, said, if we take his yoke on us, we won't just find physical rest. Put Jesus, full control. Jesus is Lord. I am one with him. We will find rest in our souls. Not just our bodies, our souls will find rest, right? And that then, the seventh day was the shadow, but that is the reality, the true Sabbath. Ceasing from our own work because we, we wear his yoke on us. On the Sabbath, they were not allowed to do their own works. They had to cease from them. But the true Sabbath, as taught in Hebrews 4, especially in verse 10, is ceasing from our own works now that we're one with Jesus, now that we wear the yoke, and only doing his. So here in Isaiah 58, so we had to go that so we would understand what he's teaching us in Isaiah 58. Here in Isaiah 58, God speaks of this way ahead of time. And he says, if you turn your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your own pleasure on my holy day, which now is every day because I'm one with Jesus, and you call the Sabbath a delight, say, I love only doing your will, God. I love it. I love it. And it's the holy day of the Lord. It's an honorable thing. God, I honor this holiness, this oneness we have. And then he says, this is how we do it. And you honor him. This is Isaiah 58, 13 and 14. Not doing your own ways. He said, no, you honor this Sabbath. The Sabbath where you cease from your own works and you find rest in your soul. He says, not doing your own ways. Oh, that's the way I've always done it. And that's just who I am. No, God says, now you're a new creation. You walk in my ways, my ways. And, and, and he says, and not finding your own pleasure. Oh, I'm going to do my will. My no, not my will, Lord. But yours be done because now Jesus is the head. And, oh, here we go. Not speaking your own words. Yeah. The next verse tells us what God promises will happen if one is willing to consecrate themselves to the Lord this way. He says, then you will delight yourself in the Lord. The Lord will really be your joy. And I, God says, you don't have to scramble for it, try for it, grab, coerce. No, I will cause you to ride upon the high places of the earth. God says, I will take you from the garbage dump, the dung hill, he actually called it, and set you with the rulers of my people. I will give you the best of my powerful kingdom. And he says, and I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father. What, 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 what heritage did Jacob receive from his grandfather Abraham? <laughs> it was the sevenfold blessing of God found in Genesis chapter 12. That was Jacob's heritage. Did you know in Galatians 3, 9 in the New Testament, God says this, So then they which be of faith 
are blessed with faithful Abraham. Verse 14 of that same chapter says that the blessing of Abraham might come upon us through Jesus Christ. So there, God says to one who consecrates themselves to the Lord in all their words, they put themselves in the place of God's matchless blessing. Powerful and wondrous. Number two, John 7, 18 Jesus tells us another result of consecrating our words to the Lord. Jesus said, he who speaks from himself seeks his own glory. I speak for, I want to say this. I, 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 I'm saying this. We may dare to say, I don't have to be broken to God's spirit in everything I say, do I? You know, I've got some good things in me, you know. But good is not the same as God. The difference between the two of us is as far as the heavens are above the earth, Isaiah 55, 9 tells us. And John 3, 6 tells us this. That which is born of flesh, my natural man, it's only flesh. But that which is born of God's spirit, that is spirit. So Jesus said, he that speaks from himself seeks his own glory. But he that seeks the glory of the one who sent him, Lord, I consecrate my words to you. I'm not speaking for myself. I will learn to be broken to your spirit. It says, he is true. And there is no unrighteousness in him. I said these were promises that were so, so wondrous, right? When I consecrate my words to God, he says, God's righteousness will be established through me there in that place. Thirdly, James 3, 2 tells us this secret. It says, we all stumble in many things. There that stumbling is talking about we, 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 we disobey the Lord. We fall out of his way. He says, but if anyone doesn't stumble in word, he is a perfect man. This perfect here has to do with a perfect puzzle. That means it's not missing any pieces. It doesn't mean we never make a mistake. It means Every part of our life is under God's control. Because he go on to say, if he doesn't stumble in word, he's a perfect man and able to bridle the whole body. Yes, if I do not stumble into sin with my words, I am able to bring every other part of my life under God's control. Jesus spoke of this in John 14, 10. He said, don't you believe that I'm in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak, oh, I don't speak from myself. But the Father that dwells in me, he does the works. In other words, because I don't speak my own words, the Father does all of his works through me. Speaking only the words that the Father gave Jesus to speak made room for the Father to do his works through him. Choosing to speak my own words limits God from working through me in other ways. But yielding to God with all my words makes a highway for God to work through me. Then fourthly, John chapter 12, in verse 49 and 50, Jesus speaks of another truth about consecrating ourselves to God in our speaking. He says this, I have not spoken from myself. Some versions say, on my own authority. Jesus said, I don't talk on my own authority. I don't speak my own words. 
But the Father who sent me gave me a command, what I should say and what I should speak. <laughs> Some versions say, what I should say and how I should say it. And then he says this. He says, in other words, and that's good. Because I know that his command is everlasting life. Where you obey the Lord, you give him full control. That's where the powerful life of God is. He says, therefore, whatever I speak, because, because his command is everlasting life. Therefore, what I speak. Let me try it again. Therefore, whatever I speak, just as the Father has told me, so I speak. When we are obedient to the Lord Jesus as our head, and we being his body, as 1 Corinthians 12, 27 teaches us, Ephesians 5 teaches us, it's reality of our oneness. It's not just like a thought or an idea. Just like marriage. Are you married? Yes. But there's no reality. It's just something I say. Well, no, marriage is all reality. So our covenant with Jesus, we say, yeah, I'm a Christian, but there's no, it's just what we say, but it doesn't have substance. Yes, the substance of being joined to Jesus, its reality is, right? We often say it's 1 Corinthians 6, 17. He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. Now I have God's spirit in me. It's Christ. Jesus said, I'm going away, but I'll send my spirit. He will dwell with you. He'll be the comforter. He will teach you. He will guide you. He will show you all things. And as we are one with that Holy Spirit, do you remember what Galatians 6 told us? He says, he that sows to the flesh, I follow what my flesh wants. Might be good, but it isn't God. Shall of that flesh, I sowed those seeds to my, myself, myself, I, I will reap that which perish. It's not eternal. But he that sows to the Spirit, remember we're one with God's Spirit, shall of the Spirit reap life. Jesus said, my Father's command, I speak only his words because his command is life. Life, the supernatural life. Of God. God's supernatural life comes where? From such sowing to the Spirit of God. Proverbs 18:21 speaks of this truth also. It says, Death and life, yes, the life of God, are in the power of my tongue. It is. If I bring it under the authority of God's Holy Spirit. Proverbs 10, 11 says, The mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life. Jesus spoke of his spirit being on us, in us as the fountain of his perpetual life in us. Consecrating our mouth into the Lord causes us to bring life-giving words to other that bring a harvest of his life. Closing then, are you and I consecrated to the Lord in all of our words? That's a new growth in the Lord, isn't it? But if you and I take his word serious, seriously, we receive it. Sometimes it takes a while to, to, to incorporate it into my soul. Remember the law of the Lord converts my soul. It's in graft. Did James says into my soul. But if we do, if we just say, oh yeah, the Bible says that. Well, and that seed is lost. It brings no fruit in us. But if we say, Lord, yes, I hear. And now I'm going to step into that new place with you. A new consecration. I want to learn, Father. Then what did we learn? Four things. It will bring his matchless blessing, the blessing of Abraham, the heritage of Jacob. Secondly, it will bring his righteousness there. There is no unrighteousness in him, Jesus said, John 7, 18. Thirdly, 
it will make a highway for God to work through me. For if my words are consecrated to him, the rest of me is too, James 3.8 taught us. And then fourthly, it brings God's supernatural life. For my words are born of his spirit. Amen. Let's pray together.